Um, there's a close connection with this talk and the previous talk, but um, uh, I'll start from square one, which is cryo-EM. Um, so, of course, this is the experimental setup where uh, some particles are flash frozen in the aqueous solution, and we collect these uh, images, uh, micrographs, and in there, there are many uh, particle images from which we try to reconstruct the 3D uh, molecule. So um, I'll primarily focus on the following simplified mathematical model for cryo-EM here, which is already quite rich and challenging. We'll try to recover a function phi uh, from R3 to R um, from randomly rotated projections. Okay, so um, the uh, image associated with the rotation R in 3D, I'll denote by I sub R, and to, to form it, we apply the rotation R to phi, and then integrate out Z, um, and uh, add um, noise epsilon. Okay, so here, um, I'll assume that the rotations are following some distribution on SO3, and um, the noise will also, uh, typically we'll take that to be um, Gaussian. Okay, so this is neglecting some important uh, practical uh, issues. Um, translations due to off-centering in the particle picking and contrast transfer functions, for example. Okay, but um, here I'll, I'll, still, I'll still mostly focus on, on this model. Um, okay, so here are some of the um, benefits of cryo-EM. It's a driver of drug discoveries. Um, I mean, I think people here know uh, this much better than me, but um, it, uh, it's played a role in COVID-19 vaccine development, for example. And it was recognized by a Nobel Prize in 2017. So um, computationally, it's a challenging nonlinear inverse problem with very low signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, so this is something that's particular about this application, the low SNR. And here's a table extracted from a paper from 2012, um, where, which is the purpose of here is just to show that computationally it is a hard problem. So although this is 10 years ago, um, 56 cores were used in this computation. And you can just look at the wall clock timings. I mean, it was 13.6 hours for one of the molecules and 41.5 for the rotavirus. So okay, it's, um, it's, it's not a straightforward problem, as we know. Um, so 3D reconstruction, I'll view here as a statistical estimation problem, right? So we're trying to estimate phi, and we're given various observations of the form I sub R. Uh, okay, and the randomness comes in the noise epsilon and the rotation R, and there could be randomness also in translations, which I'm neglecting here. So in general, in statistics, um, like we saw in the last talk, there's Basically, there are, there are two um, uh, strategies for parameter estimation, um, two main ones. Um, one is maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and uh, it has associated with it the expectation maximization algorithm, the EM algorithm. Okay, there's another approach to parameter estimation, which is based on a different cost function and that's the method of moments. Um, it's another general approach. And there, there's sort of no um, uh, sort of analog to EM, I would say. Uh, to, to carry out the method of moments, you have to fit uh, empirical moments to, to population moments, and that typically involves dealing with a system of nonlinear multivariate equations. And um, naturally enough, um, higher order tensors come into play when you look at um, higher moments, multivariate moments. Okay, so um, 
leading software for cryo EM is using um, MLE and EM, but not the method of moments. So that's, you won't find that. I want to give a toy example on the method of moments. So this has nothing to do with cryo. This is just like stats 101. Um, what is the method of moments? Uh, so we'll just quickly do this. Suppose x is a, a random uh, variable, a uniform from A to B, and I just want to estimate A and B from samples of x. And so what does the method of moments do? We're trying to estimate the parameters A and B. Um, well, you can look at the first moment of x. That'll be the average of the endpoints, okay? um, A plus B over 2. You can also look at the second moment of x, so that'll be the expectation of x squared. That works, that turns out to be given by this polynomial expression in a and b, a squared plus a b plus b squared over 3. Okay, and the idea is that you um, can equate these expectations with averages over your samples. Okay, so um, the mean. Uh, is estimated from the samples is just the average of the mean, and the second moment is estimated from the samples as the average of xi squared. Okay, um, so you equate these polynomial expressions here in A and B with these things you estimate from data on the right side, and you solve for A and B. Okay, and here you can do it in closed form. Okay, so this is a very simple example. Uh, univariate and two moments suffice, there's a closed form expression, but the basic idea of the method of moments is equating population moments with sample moments. Okay, it turns out that the method of moments is actually a very old idea in cryo-EM, but it hasn't uh, taken off. Um, so if we trace back to, to this paper, um, published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology in 1980 by Zvi Kam. <clears throat> this is sort of the origin of the idea. Okay, so he actually, it was received in 77. And so you, just to see the title here, it's the reconstruction of the structure from electron micrographs of randomly oriented particles. So he was really studying the model that I showed on the, in the early slides randomly oriented uh, particles. And um, so it was a new method. Um, yeah, so you can see the analysis is based on the calculation and accumulation of the spatial correlation of the densities on the electron micrographs uh, from which spherical harmonic coefficients can be found. Okay, so a lot of ideas are actually present in this paper. Uh, and what I, what this talk is mostly about is, is an attempt to um, revive this technique and, and make it, um, study it theoretically and, and, and maybe make it practical. Okay, so we have here a different computational strategy for cryo-EM 3D reconstruction um, than you see in, for example, rely on. We'll try to recover the signal, um, that is the molecule represented by phi, from its moments, the moments of the images. Okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, a priori, we're trying to go from images to, to molecule, right? Images are what we observe, but what we're going to do is we're going to go from images to moments and moments to molecule. Will it, so the bottom arrow is the hard part. Um, the downward arrow. So, so why, why do we wish to do this? Um, well, uh, as Tamir said, it bypasses the estimation of nuisance parameters, um, which in the model I've described are rotations per each uh, particle image. Right, so in the moment, uh, you sort of average out over all the randomness in the nuisance parameters and obtain something which uh, mostly just depends on the structure of uh, phi. So you're not estimating uh, nuisance parameters per each image in this strategy. In particular, the variables uh, are much lower dimensional. You only go after phi, and for the 100,000 plus images, you don't have to estimate phi parameters, rotations and translations. And as Tamir argued, possibly this can also deal with very low SNR. Okay, 
So, okay, that's nice. Another thing is that, uh, in principle, you only need to do one, one pass over the data. So to do this, this um, arrow at the top, you just go over the images and just calculate these moments. And then you don't necessarily need to look at those images again. It's a single pass. Okay. Um, one of the themes in this talk is that we actually can show some theoretical guarantees for the method of moments um, that, to my knowledge, aren't as present for uh, EM-based approaches in cryo-EM. So um, if you're interested in sort of rigorous reconstruction, you, you want to be sure that you're getting the right structure, then you know, maybe the method of moments is, um, is attractive to you. I'm, I'm not saying we've, it's available yet, but... There are some theoretical guarantees I'll talk about here. Um, in particular, uniqueness and sample efficiency. Um, in principle, uh, we can incorporate at least discrete heterogeneity into this framework. I won't talk about this, and this I would say is still quite, um, quite a lot to do there. Um, and another point I want to make is that it's really a completely orthogonal algorithmic strategy than what other um, packages are using. So it can be useful from the point of view of validation, like we saw in a talk on Monday. So, that, um, so these are some, some motivations. Okay, so um, I'll use the language of moments in this talk, but they are autocorrelation functions, like um, as Tamir was calling them. Okay, so here the, oh, there should be a hat here. Sorry about that. So um, the first moment, uh, as estimated from the images, it's just the, the mean image. And if we, um, we, we think of that as a function from R2 to R. So that's the first moment. Um, we'll have to discretize it in practice some way. Uh, the second moment is going to be a function on two image planes. Okay. So uh, I give you a point in the first, uh, a point in the a copy of the first image plane, and a point in a copy of the second image plane, and you tell me the correlation between those two locations, averaged out over the data. Okay. Likewise, with the third moment, that's recording correlations between three uh, locations in the image, three pixels. So it's a function from R two to the three to R. Okay, so this is what we're, we're talking about. Okay, so here um, I want to uh, package a lot of uh, work uh, in a single theorem statement. Um, okay, so the question is, how many images do we need in cryo-EM? Um, okay, so um, consider our model here. Um, for image formation, where the uh, epsilon is pixel-wise IID Gaussian with variance sigma squared. So um, one result, which I'm stating informally here, is that the number of images required to recover phi for any estimation procedure uh, scales as sigma to the 2D. As, as, as the noise sigma is growing, that's the asymptotic here, where this exponent d is the minimal degree such that the first d moments determine phi. Okay, so this is a statement that applies to EM as well, or at any estimation procedure for this model. The number, of, the amount of data you need is really controlled by this D, and it's the, the fewest number of moments required. So the moments are actually driving the amount of data in this model uh, when the noise is growing. Okay, the second point is that if uh, mu, which is this uh, probability distribution over SO3 from which we're sampling the rotations, if that is uniform, then D equals three. Okay, so uh, uniform case for cryo-EM, you need to go to third moments. And um, Cam was already going to third moments in his paper, but it wasn't proven to be sufficient. 
Okay, we um, had a result <coughs> that uh, it's counterintuitive um, that if mu is band limited in a certain sense, so this distribution of rotations is, is smooth, a smooth distribution over rotations, it's band limited and generic subject to being band limited, then actually you can get away with um, just the mean and the covariance uh, information theoretically. Okay, so actually non-uniform rotations can enable you to, to, to use fewer images in this model. Okay, so this is um, putting together uh, different uh, results from different papers. Um, uh, one with Afonso Bendera, Ben Bloom Smith, um, Amelia Perry, Alex uh, Wine, and Jonathan Niles Weed. Another by uh, another group um, uh, in which Roy uh, uh, was a member, and Zofon. And, and others, um, and um, then um, this paper on the non-uniform rotations was with Nir Sharon uh, Yu Hao Ku, who's here, Boris Landa, and Amit Singer. Yep. Do, do you need to know uh, mu, and if you need, how well? Uh, you don't. You don't need to know mu. But you say band limited. So you need to know the band. Yeah, you need to know the band. Okay. Yeah, so like this result, um, we haven't been able to convert this to a um, practical algorithm. Um, but if you know the band, otherwise you don't know mu, then d equals two is, um, is working, yeah. is, is sufficient. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so the upshots of this is that, uh, are the following. It's easy to see that the method of moments, which is one estimation procedure, only needs on the order of sigma to the 2D many images. Um, and that's, that's how many images it needs to accurately estimate autocorrelations up to order D. Okay, so, um, so therefore, by the previous slide, the method of moments on, uh, in this model uses a, a minimal possible number of images, at least in terms of the asymptotic order uh, for, for large noise sigma. Okay, so there are, are um, ongoing efforts uh, to produce uh, ab initio algorithms from this for homogeneous cryo-EM, or possibly cryo-EM with discrete heterogeneity or even um, where we don't do particle picking like Tamir was saying. It's based on inverting the moments. Uh, in particular, in the rest of the talk, I want to uh, focus on a recent line of attack, uh, which, uh, where we try to use priors in the method of moments. And I'll talk mostly about this recent paper with Tamir, Yu Hao, uh, Oscar Mikulin, and Demet Singer. And by the way, um, regarding Oscar, I, I need to thank him. He um, prepared many of these slides. So thank you to Oscar. Many of the, the next set of slides that you'll see. Okay, so um, what, what's the prior going to be that we place into the method of moments? Um, it's, we'll say that a, a molecule should be sparse. Okay, so what exactly do we mean by that? Okay, well, before that, let's just notice, or being at IPAM um, and talking about sparsity, here's a salute to um, Stan Osher, who, uh, paraphrasing, says that everything is sparse. Okay, so in that sense, no motivation is needed. Um, but um, the, the, the way in which we'll mean sparsity are the following two, two ways. So, one is we'll think about a Gaussian mixture model. And um, we, think of this, we, we think of this as one Gaussian per atom. But you don't necessarily have to view it in that way. Uh, we'll just represent the function phi as, a, as a, a superposition of Gaussians. So it's actually, it shouldn't be mixture here. It's, it's a Gaussian superposition model. Um, that's one 
sort of notion of sparsity in some sense. Um, another is that phi in a wavelet basis is actually just sparse. That's another um, notion of sparsity that we'll, we'll think about. Okay, so the main theoretical result in this um, uh, paper from September is the following. So for generic sparse structures, where I'll say what sparse model exactly I mean in a few slides, the second moment suffices to estimate phi, even if the rotations are uniform. Okay, so very, uh, we, yeah. Whereas previously, uh, without any model on phi, you needed to go to the third moment uh, with, with uniform rotations. Okay, okay here's the model. So the, simp the most idealized one, uh, I was actually delighted to see in, in a talk on, on, on Monday, um, delta functions came up. Um, so our most idealized model is that phi is just a weighted sum of delta functions. Okay. Um, and um, that came up in, um, in a practical setting on Monday, actually. So, so we'll say that uh, P is uh, at least, uh, uh, we have P deltas uh, located at positions AI in R3. Uh, so the, the vectors AI are the positions and they're weighted by WI. Um, and so our, this, there's a result that assuming some non-degeneracy condition on the AI's holds, there's an algorithm that recovers the positions of these atoms and their weights up to a rotation and reflection in R3 from the second moment. And it's actually an efficient algorithm. It's quadratic in the number of delta functions. So when you say up to, you mean up to a global rotation? Up to a global of, rotation, yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Turns out to be a sort of a theoretical algorithm and doesn't behave nicely with respect to discretization. So we end up doing proposing something else. But this is still quite interesting. Um, okay, so here's just a visualization of the model. Um, okay, so this is supposed to represent a delta function at that point, and the radius here is wi. Okay, so we have a picture like this. This is our phi. Um, and, okay, so this is, say, an image. We're going to pixelate it, actually. Um, uh, 2 to the m by 2 to the m grid. So, um, and, and then uh, we're later going to uh, blur, blur this. So, any, I'll, I'll say more about that later. Okay, so, so yeah, so there's a uh, more technical statement here which involves this richer model. So, so let me go back to this. So um, we have a more richer model, a, a more rich model where we pixelate the images and blur the images. So um, not just delta functions, okay? And, and, um, and what we show is that in this richer model with pixelation and Gaussian blurring, um, under the same degeneracy conditions for the AIs, basically if the resolution in the images is, is high enough, so if you have enough pixels in the image, then the second moment uh, also uniquely determines the set of uh, AIs and WIs up to a global rotation and reflection. So even with pixelation, this, re this theoretical result is robust. Okay. And Okay, I want to briefly sketch the proof. Um, it's actually, okay, um, it's a little fun, but um, just briefly sketch it. So the, the main idea is that f from the second moment, if we go back to the, del the, the model of delta functions, we're going to use very qualitative information from that second moment. So remember, it's a function on R2 times R2 to R. We'll just use information on what its support is the support of that function. Uh, and the main idea is to compute these triples from the support. So for every um, i and j, every pair of deltas, we're going to tell you the norm of ai, the norm of aj, and their inner product. And once you have all that information, you know 
all the norms of the different atoms. So you've, you've got them on spheres in R3, and you also know the angles between them. Um, it's not hard to just um, put that all together and figure out the entire position of all the atoms. So these ladder, ladder steps I'll gloss over. Yes? So I have a question regarding permutation of the atoms. So yeah. here your solution is basically you can permute them all and you'll get the same. Yeah. What happens if you now have different types of atoms or you want some type of linkage between like a little bit more chemistry? Yeah, we'll also get the WIs. So like we don't just recover the positions of the atoms, we've attached masses to them. And this algorithm will also recover those masses. So, so, it, so it's invariant to your permutation of your atoms? Yes. Anything? It's invariant to the permutation. So what we're going to output is a set, a set of pairs of locations and masses. There's no ordering in our output. OK. Thank you. OK, so yeah, this is the interesting step. Um, how do you get these? You're getting the lengths uh, of, the, of the atoms and the angles between them. Um, OK, so this is sort of a, the main idea is that every pair of atoms is actually contributing a component in the um, second moment. So the second moment turns out, because we have delta function model here, the second moment turns out to be a singular measure an R2 times R2, its support turns out to be a, some three-dimensional object in R, in, in R2 times R2. And for every pair of atoms, you have a piece, a different component in that, in that support. And um, so this is, this is some set in R2 times R2. It's basically everything you get by taking, so it's, it's attached to a pair of atoms, ij. You look at everything you can get by rotating uh, AI and AJ by some common rotation in 3D and then just projecting them down to the plane. So just, um, yeah, you look at this set and it turns out to come up in the support of um, the second moment. And so it's a, it's a very intuitive set actually. You're just uh, looking at sort of all possible projections of AI and AJ when they've been acted on by the same rotation. And yeah, this is pictures of these sets. So the sets are 3D and 4D, but we've projected them down to 3D here. Um, the key thing about these sets is that they're actually defined by a degree four polynomial. Um, and the nice, so, so these, these sets, these SIJs are, are given as the zero set of some degree four polynomial and the coefficients of those polynomials and enable you to just read off these, these quantities, the lengths of the atoms and the angles. Okay, so that's, um, that's the, the main idea, that the support of the second moment comes in these pieces, and these pieces are defined by polynomials, and their coefficients tell you what you want. I'm going to skip over this. Um, here, the only thing I'll mention is that in practice, if you can just identify a few points uh, in the support of the second moment, then you can interpolate to find these, um, these polynomials with the coefficients you want. Okay, so anyways, so I've briefly sketched how you get these lengths and angles. The rest, I'm just going to refer you to the paper. <laughs> okay, so... This was the, a key, the key step. OK, so what now? So we just presented um, a very theoretical model uh, under which we had identifiability for sparse structures from the second moment. Um, like I mentioned, it, it can be uh, pixelated and blurred, getting us closer to, 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 to reality. So that's nice. But what we have is identifiability. How do you actually recover numerically phi? Um, okay, so the proof was sort of an algorithm um, that, that I just sketched, but that algorithm doesn't turns out to not behave nicely with respect to discretization. So what can we do that's more stable? Okay, so um, just doing gradient descent on a nonlinear least squares between the, the, between the second moment in um, this, the second analytical moment and the second sample moment 
in this problem has a lot of bad local minima. It doesn't work well. Just doing nonlinear least squares gradient descent. So what we propose is something else. Um, let's try some alternating algorithm. Okay, and it's, it's not clear yet what we're going to alternate between. But um, on the one hand, we have our, well, okay, I can say some. Actually, on the one hand, we have our sparse structures. So um, we have our prior here. That's our, this yellow set. And on the other hand, we have the set of molecules that fit the um, empirical second moment. So from the data, we get the second moment, we get this blue set. We're really looking at the intersection there. We want to, so we could try to alternate between fitting to data and enforcing sparsity back and forth. Okay, so the main numerical result um, is a procedure to do this. Here we, we um, use a different uh, notion of sparsity, uh, sparsity in, 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 um, in expansion coefficients. So um, we're going to expand phi. We're not, we're, not, we're not dealing with deltas at this point anymore. We'll expand phi uh, hat, the Fourier transform of phi, in some nice basis functions. So these are spherical harmonic functions, um, which you may have seen before. And these are some nice radial functions, these j's, um, spherical bessels. Okay, so they're Bessel functions of the first kind, and these are spherical harmonics, which are convenient to rotate. Okay, so these are fixed functions, these j's and y's, and the information of the molecule is completely contained in these a coefficients, and that's what we're after, these expansion coefficients. So very roughly speaking, this is like a Fourier series expansion of the molecule, but we're in 3D, so we have these functions instead. Okay, the details aren't so crucial here. Okay, but so this is what we're after, these expansion coefficients. Um, and they're actually, they turn out to be triply indexed. But if you freeze one index, which is this L, the spherical harmonic degree, then you get a matrix. And it's convenient to think of the molecule, phi hat, as being specified by a sequence of matrices AL, which are storing these expansion coefficients. Okay, so we're really after these AL matrices. And what Cam did in that paper I showed is um, he really analyzed the second moment well. And he showed that the, the second moment gives you these expansion coefficients, these AL matrices, up to some unknown orthogonal matrix. So for every uh, frequent spherical harmonic degree L, you can almost get all the expansion coefficients, but you're off by some 2L plus one by 2L plus one orthogonal matrix, which you need to solve for using other information. Okay, so that's, what, that's exactly what the second moment tells you. And the very nice thing about this is um, this characterizes the set of uh, expansion coefficients that uh, fit some prescribed moments. So we know exactly the set of molecules that fit empirical moments. They're just given by this. Um, and, we, and we can calculate this from the second moment. Okay, so, so this leads to the so-called orthogonal matrix retrieval problem in, that, that has been studied uh, by some people in cryo-EM where you use the second moment and then you're trying to get these orthogonal matrices. Okay, so we'll try to do this with sparsity. Um, so we have two, pr two sets here. We have the structures with the second moments agreeing with the data. Those are all the structures of the form AL uh, OL that we get from, uh, estimate from data times some uh, arbitrary orthogonal matrix O. Um, and then we have all the molecules that are sparse in our basis. Okay, so actually you can project on both of these sets. That's something quite magical here. You have closed form projections here. Um, projecting onto sparse things, um, that you can do by thresholding. Um, so that's an easy projection. This projection is a so-called uh, Procrustes problem. So you can have a closed form procedure for this projection, um, enforcing the correct second moments via a sort of SVD. 
uh, what we want is the overlap. We want to be sparse and have the right second moments. So you could just try to alternate. Project on uh, enforce sparse, enforce second moments back and forth to try to get um, something in the intersection. That turns out to not work so well here. And the trouble is that there are extra fixed points here, uh, or, or cycles rather. Um, and you can sometimes um, converge to something not in the intersection. Instead, we use this um, uh, relaxed reflect reflect procedure, which is a little more mild than just harshly reflecting to one set back and forth. So this is the so-called RRR scheme um, that I, I believe came out of the phase retrieval and x-ray crystallography literature. We try that here. Um, okay, and I won't get into the details so much, but it's in, you don't quite uh, project all the way to one set. You sort of reflect over it back and forth. And the very nice property of this scheme is that if it converges, it must converge to something in the intersection. So um, you can never have spurious convergence with this RRR scheme, but what you can have is a failure of convergence. It sort of just oscillates on and on. Okay, so we implemented this. Um, so these are our ground truth structures. C and D correspond to, to molecules in PDB, and E is Shep, Logan, Phantom. Phantom. Here I'm showing these ground truths, um, these green ground truths, but projected down to our basis. So we, we've only expanded these up to some finite band limit. And this is what you look like, this is what you get um, in that expansion for the spherical bezel. So sort of the best we could hope for, because we, um, we are only trying to find the expansion coefficients, is these purple guys. Okay, and this is what the algorithm retrieves, so it's not, Certainly not an exact reconstruction, but it's achieving um, sort of the general shape of the, of the purple structures. Okay, so um, here are some, um, here's the running FSC as the algorithm, as the RRR scheme is iterating. So these are the, the curves. Um, let me, there's a video here, let me play this. This is actually RRR running. So what happens is there's, with RRR typically, as I understand it, there's often uh, an initial um, improvement, rapid improvement, and then oscillatory behavior as RRR is exploring. And then if you're lucky, you get the final uh, rapid convergence to an intersection point. And um, we didn't quite observe that last step here, but we did benefit from the um, initial rapid improvement. Um, this, um, I, bel I have to ask Oscar about that. I don't want to say something incorrect here. So I believe we fed uh, the algorithms the exact second moments here. So in that sense, it's not with noise, but I, I have to check that. And if, so you ran this algorithm to find an intersection point without necessarily knowing it was a unique intersection right. point. Right, right, so with your results, we, we know that that's unique. So I'll come to that, yeah, thank you. I have you. a question in the middle. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. If you, well, maybe you, the previous one you showed, no, 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 the, the one. Yeah. Well, I, I just, the, the, the previous slide showed, you showed, one the middle, Look at the middle column, yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, this is okay, but the, the, the next one, I mean, you got, seems like rotated by 180 degrees. The, there's maybe just in the intermediate states. No, I mean, here seems okay, but uh, you, you just- Oh, here? Uh, you, you write some, somehow- uh, Here? No, here's a, but- uh, Yeah, here, I mean, this is what we initialized RRR at. So these are bad structures, but we, we run it, and then we end up with this. Yeah. Are, are, are you saying that we didn't? I didn't align the figure nicely. No, or? no. I, 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 no, no, no. No, I, I, no, I, no. I, I saw your the, but that's gone. Seems like the 
the D in the uh, bottom one, one, the video is some rotate 180 degrees. Oh, that's really interesting. Because so. in face retrieval, yeah, uh, we we we're very familiar. The, the uh, image and the complex of image, the, the conjugate is cannot distinguish. I'm just wondering whether you have a similar problem. Mm -hmm. The image and the complex. That's a very interesting it's, thing. It's, it's just rotating. Like, You're yeah. saying right here, it's sort of rotating. Yeah, you can see, you can see here, right? Yeah. Like here, the, the the purple one and the bottom, the middle. Mm -hmm. As it exactly tilted 180 degrees, rotate 180 degrees. Okay, yeah, thank you a lot for that insight. I'll try to follow up on that. Is there a mathematical insight of why this? Because from face of the retrieval community, we know it. Because I, the face and the conjugated face, you get an absolute value, you get the same diffraction. Kind yeah. Of but is this the same applicable here? Uh, I didn't notice this phenomenon until you pointed it out, so I have to go think about it. But, but these are not the same ambiguities like in face retrieval. It's but a different why, ambiguity. But why, why is it trapped there here? Basically, you have like here the ambiguity is like O3, like the entire orthogonal group. But it has a bigger. But it has a reflection. It has, it has a, a reflection. reflection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it could be that you're seeing the reflection, and that is that is the non-abelian version of of this yeah. thing that you're doing. In, Let's in, 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 try to in, think in, more about so that. Yeah. Constant yeah. Rotation right. So, so it's like O2 is like, like the yeah. group, and then this is O3, which is SO2. Okay. SO3. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so including the video in this talk was a good decision. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to say things I omitted here. Um, what, the first one is how do you estimate the, the covariance matrix, the second moment, from the noisy images? Um, and for, how do you do that in the presence of CTFs for contrast transfer functions? So. Um, Nick Marshall, um, Oscar Michelin, sorry, I misspelt, um, that's, a, that's a K there. Um, Young Peng Shi and Amit Singer had a really nice recent work on uh, a fast way to get that um, covariance matrix. And so we, uh, even with the CTFs in there, you, so you can sort of undo the effect of the CTFs as I understand it from their work. Um, I haven't discussed how you choose hyperparameters here. So in particular, how do you choose the sparsity level? Or in the algorithm, maybe it makes sense to start with something very sparse and sort of relax the sparsity a little bit. Um, what should be the schedule of sparsity levels? I haven't discussed that. Um, I understand we, we don't have a great answer for that as, as yet, but it's interesting. I didn't say how you enrich the delta function model to go uh, from delta functions to Gaussians of finite width. We have that in our paper. It's quite technical. Also, um, uh, Tamir and Dan have a really uh, nice related paper that appeared shortly after um, on uh, identifiability theorems when uh, phi is sparse. Um, uh, with respect to some orthonormal basis. So for example, uh, some generic orthonormal basis, and likely it applies to wavelets. Um, okay, so the identifiability I, I, I showed here was in the delta function model, but there's also very nice results uh, it, when you have sparsity with respect to wavelets. I didn't discuss here how you could incorporate other side information, like non-negativity of a fee, or another idea that's come up is sort of trying to fit to a denoised image. So suppose you could get sort of one really fairly clean image and you try to fit to that. It's an idea that we had with Eitan Levin, Tamir, uh, Bumal, and Amit Singer, and that was really nicely uh, developed uh, by Jane Zhao and co authors recently. Um, and I also um, to give a shout out to a poster outside, there's a connection between class averaging, uh, which is at a higher level in the pipeline that I haven't discussed in the talk, and the method of moments applied to mixture models. And that's some um, joint work with um, Yifan Zhang, uh, my student, and um, you can see a poster out there, although we consider it in sort of a much broader context. Um, okay, so I just want to conclude with uh, a few uh, fun slides. So something that we've started at IPAM, I've been a, um, a, partic a, a core participant here the last um, few months, and so we've done something with Mark uh, 
Gills, uh, Nick Marshall, and Eric Verbecki, and this will only take a few moments to describe. Um, it's, it's in progress. So our, our idea is, well, to get an in initial structure that's okay for refinement, uh, what kind of prior could we use? Um, well, what better prior could there be than the protein data bank itself? So here's a naive idea. Um, you, you could try to conduct a search problem over the protein data bank. So suppose you just go through all the structures deposited there and pre-compute the second moment, their second moments the second moments of the things in PDB, say under some fixed library of rotational distributions. Okay. Now given an experimental data set, let's estimate the second moment. Um, okay, we can do that. And then if we find the nearest second moment to these pre-computed, uh, the, the, the nearest second moment from PDB to the experimental second moment, how about using that molecule as an initialization to refinement procedures, other method of moments or EM-based procedures? So it's something that you could try and just fitting to PDB more or less and trying to find uh, the closest known structure to your experimental data set. So here's a fun picture that is due to Eric uh, Verbecki here. Um, so what we have here, uh, Eric has a thousand PDB structures uh, from the same enzyme class. Um, we've computed, we, uh, we've pre-computed the second moments of these guys under uniform rotations. Okay, so those are points in a high dimensional space in the second moment space. And we projected them down to the plane via standard nonlinear dimensionality reduction, TISNI. And this is the picture you get. Okay, so it's, it's actually, for, we compared this to what you get by putting in random arrays instead of the second moments from PDB, and you don't get a picture like this. So this is actually, their structure here, just from the Tisney visualization, and nearby points actually seem to correspond to related molecules. Um, okay, so that's um, something that we're exploring further with people here at IPAM. Okay, so conclusions very quickly. The method of moments sheds light on how many images you need in cryo-EM. Uh, using tools from algebra, um, as I sketched sort of in, in, the, in, the, in the one proof that I sketched, we're able to prove identifiability results, um, which go along the lines of there's a unique structure fee matching with the first two or, third, or, or three moments under appropriate assumptions. Algorithm divide in development in this space is currently active. Uh, one idea is to exploit priors about real life protein structures. And um, after further developments, hopefully the method of moments can serve a helpful role in cryo-EM pipelines, particularly I think in validation. I think that's a, um, a good use for it. And also when other methods are struggling, perhaps with um, small mo molecules as Tamir was saying. Okay, so thanks for your attention.